Okay, so today we're going to um, kind of take a step back in a way in the world of Rhino, uh, and we're going to talk about real basic 2D drawing um, and 2D drawing techniques because I think it's important that we really um, we get comfortable with that and we get comfortable with how coordinates are described and input and whatever. So today, unfortunately, won't be the most exciting day in the world, but at the same time, we have to start at a certain basic level. If you're familiar with AutoCAD and the coordinate system, all of this will seem completely uh, obvious to you. But for those of you that aren't, I, I like to, to go through it in a little bit more detail. Uh, so a couple things. One, when we first open Rhino uh, to begin with, a lot of times we're presented with the option here in this splash screen when we create a new drawing. There are templates listed that are either large objects feet and inches or small objects feet and inches. The one we're always going to pick is the large objects inches. Um, some people prefer to model in feet. Um, the truth is that you can model in either one. The problem is that a lot of the materials that we're going to use are already set for inches as the default unit, so it's better if we use inches as the default unit. And when you're typing in, you can use an apostrophe for feet. It still recognizes feet. It's just the defaults are set to inches. Uh, the large object just means that it's geared for larger objects, which we're going to be primarily doing with architectural objects. So they're going to be on the larger side. So um, nothing, nothing really bad about choosing a different one. It's just easier if we, if we go ahead and pick that as the default. We can confirm down here in the bottom that our default units are in inches. Uh, it's right here behind my head. It'll say inches. Um, so we can confirm that we're in the, the correct place. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to work in entirely the top view instead of perspective view. So in the last lecture, I told you guys about double clicking on the names to switch between their views. We had previously worked with the perspective view being the large view. Um, today, we're going to make the top view the large view. So I'm going to switch to top and then double click on top to make it the larger um, view. Again, scrolling in and out um, is just as simple as scrolling with our, our scroll wheel. Ultimately, the grid is probably going to go away because we're going to be modeling so large. The grid doesn't really mean anything other than it's a reference uh, when we first start. When we deal a little bit down the road in C planes, it'll be helpful as a reference, but it's really not something uh, to worry about for right now. So you guys um, may or may not remember back to the world of like algebra. Maybe you were in high school. Maybe you took it um, here at DVC. But sometime in that world of, of, of early math, um, they talked about grids and an XY coordinates. Do you guys kind of vaguely remember that a little bit? Okay. We're going to go over it a, a little bit more today. Rhino is fundamentally a, a, a mathematical tool. Um, we're dealing with complex geometry um, through a mathematical interface. The good news is we don't have to know anything about math, and we rarely have to actually do any math to use it. But it's important to understand that that is the underlying fundamental piece of how Rhino organizes objects in space. And so when we look at a coordinate system, right, we see it up here. We have two axes. One is identified in red. One is identified in green. I should probably make, if I had a green pen, I should make this match with what we're showing here. All right, and I'll make this dashed, and this should be dashed too. So making this match up, this is exactly a mathematical plot, right? So we have what's called the origin, which is right here. I'll use a third color. We have which, what's called the origin, which is right here, which is 0, 0. And again, today we're dealing just in the flat plane. So we're just x and y coordinates. Z, if I added a third 0, would be coming out in space this way or going back toward the chalkboard. Okay? It's hard for you because I know it's blocking part of it, but it is what it is. OK, so we have a point that's 0, 0. Anything in this quadrant is going to be positive numbers. So let's say I had a point that was out here somewhere. right? X coordinate first, so it would be this distance to here. So we'll say it's maybe 2. Okay? And then followed by a positive Y coordinate. Maybe, so this, let's call this 2. We'll call this 4. right? This coordinate of that point would be 2, 4. Does that make sense? Right? Obviously, if we went in the negative direction, we'd have negative numbers. So anything going this way or this way or negative. So when we start to think about objects in space, 
in Rhino, or if we were drawing a line, for example, we can use these coordinates as a way of inputting data. Okay? And so we'll get, this is the, the kind of the first preliminary way of putting in information. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use a polyline tool, which is right here. It looks like a little angle with three dots on it. And when I click on that and I look at my command line, it says the start of the polyline. So I'm going to start my polyline at that origin point, at that 0, 0. So I'll go ahead and type in 0, 0. And that shows up in my command line at the very top of the screen. You can see that I put in 0, 0. So what this coordinate represents is something called an absolute coordinate. And an absolute coordinate means that in the entire space, starting with 0, 0 at the origin, this is where my object is going to be. So 0, 0, I start right at the origin. So no matter how much I zoom in, I keep zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, right? that point is always right at 0, 0. So we'll go ahead and zoom way out. Okay? Now if I wanted to draw a line that went straight up, that was 24 feet long, right? I could type in an, an absolute coordinate for the end point of this line. So if I wanted it 24 feet long, I wouldn't be going anything in the, the x direction, so it would be 0. So my first number would be 0. My next number would be where it falls on the y-axis, which would be at 24 feet. So I type in 0, comma, 24, followed by the apostrophe for the foot mark. Okay? And when I hit Enter, it will then draw a line that goes all the way up to 0, comma, 24 feet in space. Make sense so far? Okay. So if I wanted to draw a line that went over, say, 12 feet, sorry, I'm just making sure that I'm following along with the same order here. From this point, I wanted to go over here. It would be in the x direction, 12 feet. So I type 12 feet, and then a comma. And it would be, again, from the origin, right, 12, and then up 24. So I type 24 with the apostrophe for feet. I go ahead and hit enter, and I end up with that next line. So thus far, I've drawn a line that goes straight up, and then it goes over to there. And I've done that by typing in absolute coordinates. Now the problem is, absolute coordinates can be very difficult when you're way off in space somewhere. Okay? This is a very controlled example. It's pretty easy to see what the absolute coordinate of the next point would be. If I wanted to go down six feet, Right? We'd again know that in absolute coordinates I'd be over 12 and this time I'd be up 18. So we could mentally do it with a little bit of math. But sometimes that's hard and instead we can use what are called relative coordinates. And so instead of pegging 0, 0 at the origin, at right here, what relative coordinates do is they say relative to the last point that I clicked or relative to the starting point of the line, where do I go? So instead of 0, 0 being here, in this case, 0, 0 would be right here. So in this case, if I wanted to go down 6 feet, I could say at, the relative coordinate comes from the little at sign like an email address. I could say at 0, comma, negative 6 feet. So I'm not going anywhere in the x direction, and I'm going negative 6 feet. So sometimes this relative coordinate is useful. Right? It's essentially changing where 0, 0 is to the last point that you worked with. And so in this example, when we're drawing these straight lines, I'll go ahead and hit Enter to finish when I get there. When we're drawing these straight lines, it's not that big of a deal. But if we wanted to have something that was on a curve or on an angle, sometimes it's easier to type it in as a value. Okay? Um, and I'll show you that a little bit more. So if we did the next relative coordinate, right? we could go to, say, at... This time would be 12 feet, comma, 0, and we go over 12 feet, like that. Okay, so I'm typing in these coordinate values to get this curve. So if I wanted to go down 12 feet from here, again, I could say at um, 0, comma, negative 12 feet, and I could draw that. Okay, so now in practice, however, and I can, I'll do this whole shape again, um, I could go, I could flip back and use absolute coordinates this time. This would be 12 feet, comma, oops, I have to put the feet, 12 feet, comma, 6 feet. 
and that would give me that point. So you can see how I can flip back and forth. The difference is you have to be used to the kind of math coordinate system. Okay? And so I could finish off, uh, this would be at negative 6, oh, excuse me, at 0, comma, negative 6 feet. And then I could use absolute coordinates, 0, comma, 0, enter, I've finished my shape. Okay? Sometimes it's a little bit easier to start with the polyline and instead of typing in the coordinates as you go around, it's to type in distances. Okay, so if let's say I started over here, I don't even know where my origin is, so absolute coordinates are out, because I don't even know where this point started from. So this time, I, I know I want to go 24 feet, so I type in a distance of 24 feet, and then it's going to be followed by what direction do I want that distance to go. Okay, so right now I have a button called ortho in bold down here at the bottom, and that just means I'm only allowed to draw a straight line at 90 degrees. If I turn that off, I could draw that 24 foot line in any direction in a circle. Okay. I know I want it to be straight, so I'll go ahead and turn that ortho back on, which is on by default. And so now I'm going 24 feet in that direction. I can follow that up with the next distance, which would be 12 feet. And again, I have to pick my direction. We'll go in that direction. Follow it up with 6 feet. 12 feet, 12 feet, 12 feet, oops, helps if you can type, 12 feet, 6 feet, and then I can snap to my original point, or I can type 12 feet again, or I can type C for close, which closes the shape. Okay, so in reality, if I were sitting here drawing this shape, I would probably draw it with the direction, the distance and the direction because it's a little bit faster. But I like to introduce the concepts of coordinates because there will be a time where, say, maybe you wanted a, a line that would be on the slope of a 6 and 12 roof, right? And if I started the line here, I could say at 12 inches, comma, 6 inches, and I'd get the slope that started with that line. All right? Or I, I probably should have done it in feet. I could say at 12 feet, comma, 6 feet, and I'd have a line that's going on that particular slope. Okay? So there are moments when it's easier and faster to use a coordinate system. Mostly it's relative coordinates. But there are moments when that can be very, very valuable in your, in your um, drawings. So I like to introduce it as a very early concept uh, as part of the kind of how Rhino works in a mathematical sense. So we've done everything thus far in the 2D plane. So everything's just in x, y. We've only input values in x, y. Okay? By default, it assumes that the z value, if you don't put one in, is 0. So it's going to stay flat in what's called your c plane or your working plane. Okay? So we're assuming that for right now. So I have two different examples here of the same shape. I can go ahead and delete one. I delete objects by selecting them. And I can select them either by clicking on them or I can drag a box around them. And this brings up another um, technique. When you're selecting objects, this is exactly the same if you're selecting objects in AutoCAD as it is if you're selecting objects in Rhino. If you drag from your left to your right, anything that is fully contained within an object, so let me go ahead and uh, I'm going to explode this polyline so it's individual lines just so that this makes more sense. So these are all individual lines right now. Anything that is contained within my bounding box will be selected. So in this case, from the left to the right, anything inside of that box will be selected. If I select from right to left, this way, anything touching the bounding box will be selected. Okay? And obviously, anything completely contained would be selected. Right? Likewise, anything completely contained would be selected. So how you select an object can make a difference when you're doing your selection. Right? So this is a good point to kind of point that out. You will learn a lot more about this as you go forward in terms of you know, how objects are selected and what's the most efficient way of, of working in Rhino. Okay? Obviously, on an object like this that's a joined polyline, right? if I went and tried to select it this way, I'd get nothing unless I completely selected the whole object. Right? This way, if I touch the object, it'll be selected. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete this shape over here. I selected it and pressed the delete key on the keyboard. You could alternatively 
select it and start typing delete, D-E-L, and you see that it shows up there. That's one difference between AutoCAD. AutoCAD's delete is erase, not delete. And so if you're programmed to type erase in the command line in AutoCAD, it's a programmatic shift in your brain to, to change. OK, so I have the, the workings of the floor plan that's on the back of your sheet that you're going to be drawing today. Right? And I'm going to show you some more commands that will get you comfortable with doing this. Some of you will absolutely breeze through this plan. Right? It'll be a piece of cake. If it is a piece of cake, embellish it, change it, add to it. We will continue working with this plan and we'll build it up into 3D and make a little mini model of a house as we go forward. So if you want to play around with it and change it, by all means do it. I like to give you something to work from, so if you're not comfortable and you're just learning the basics and you've never worked in a 3D program, at least you'll have something to work from. Okay? Does that make sense? So just because this is what I drew doesn't mean this is what needs to happen on your end. Um, you, do, you definitely do not need to include the dimensions either. Those are completely for your reference. And if you decide that a window shouldn't be however big I drew it, draw it some other size. I don't care. Right? It's very much about learning to draw rather than um, making it accurate to what I was drawing. OK, so I have this closed polyline to start. And I want to start to make this into uh, a set of walls that go around my building. And so the easiest way of doing this, could I, could I start drawing a line inside of here that was six inches away from this wall? Sure. Right? But that's a little bit hard. The easiest way would be to use an offset command. And an offset takes one object and makes a copy of it a certain distance from the existing object. So we're going to go up to Curve, and then Offset, and Offset Curve. Okay? There is probably a button for picking this somewhere. I, I never do it that way. Or you could type Offset, which will get you to the same place. And so when I look at my command line up here, right, it says Select Curve to Offset, but then it gives me some options in parentheses. One is Distance, right? and this would be Distance in Inches. I have uh, the ability to make a sharp corner. I could go through a point. I have a tolerance level. I have both sides. So if I wanted to go both sides, I could do that. And then in C plane, yes, and cap is set to none. That's fine. Okay. So the first thing that I want to adjust is the distance. And so when I look at the word distance up there, I know it's at the very top. See how the D is capitalized and it's underlined? Okay. That is the keyboard shortcut to get to distance. So I can click on distance with my mouse, but I could also type the letter D followed by enter to go to distance. Okay? So as you get faster and faster at working, uh, when you use more and more of the command line, you'll start to memorize that I do offset, enter, D, enter to get straight to this command rather than having to move the mouse up and click on distance. Right? But for right, right now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with clicking on distance as a way of getting into that option. So I have offset distance, and I want to set this right now to 6 inches. Now we can have an argument about whether walls are really 6 inches thick, but that's really for a construction class, not or a working drawings class, not for this class. So we're going to go generic 6 inches. Makes life easy. So we'll hit Enter. And you see that my distance now changed from 1,200. I have no idea why it was 1,200. It was probably the last offset that I did uh, on this computer. And it's now set to 6, which is what I want it to be set to. The rest of these options are all perfectly fine. So we'll continue. So the bold is saying select curve to offset. So I'm going to need to select the curve, which is obviously going to be that curve. It's the only curve I have yet. And then it's going to say side to offset, which basically means do I want it to be on the inside or do I want it to be on the outside? And so in the case of what we're drawing today, I want it to be on the inside. So I'm going to click anywhere on the inside of this shape and it will create a second line for me. Okay? So with one command, I've drawn all of the lines that go around the inside of this particular set of walls. Okay? So as I move forward, there's a few more things that I want to do. I'm going to cut a door into this part of the wall at the center. Okay? So I'm going to come back to my polyline tool, and I want to draw a line that starts right in the center. And so the easiest way of doing that is to be able to snap to the center of these lines. Okay? And I'm going to do that by turning on this little checkbox, and it's behind my head right now, for mid, right? which is a midpoint object snap. 
which means it's going to snap to the center of any object, okay, or the midpoint of any object. So that's checked. Hopefully yours is already checked as well. And when I move up toward the center of the object, I'm suddenly going to get a little white box that says mid, okay? And my mouse is going to kind of glue onto a center point right there. When I do that and I click, I can then snap to this midpoint, right? Now notice in this case it's saying perp comma mid. It's both perpendicular to and snapping to the midpoint. So it's two snaps in one. Doesn't really matter if you didn't have perpendicular on, you wouldn't see perpendicular. So I could, for example, turn off perpendicular and all we'd see is mid. So I tend to leave perpendicular on. Okay? So when I'm done, I'll go ahead and press enter. And I now have a line that's right in the center of where the door is going to be Okay, on the back. The door, I said, was a three foot door. So I want to offset this line half of the door in one direction and half of the door in the other section. So half of 36 inches would be 18 inches or one foot six, depending on how you do the, the math in your head. Okay? So I would go back to my offset command, which is under curve, offset, offset curve, or again, I could just type offset. And I'm going to select my curve. Oh, it's not six inches that I want to go. It's 18, so I have to go back to distance. 18, and now I can offset to one side or I can offset to the other side. Okay? But I can save myself a step by clicking where it says both sides, which means it's going to offset not to one side, but to both sides. And so when I click, I get this line and that line, okay? which saves you a little bit of time. Is it necessary? No. Could I just do the offset command twice? Sure. Right? But it just saves you a little bit of time to do it. OK, so now I need to actually cut open the door. So to get rid of, right, these lines go right through my objects, I'm going to use a command called trim. And the trim command is available right here. Or I could type trim. Or I could go to, I always forget it, it's under edit trim. OK, so three different ways to get to it. And it's going to say select the cutting objects. So these are the objects that are going to do the cutting. It would be this object and this object that are going to do the cutting. I'll go ahead and press Enter. Then it says select objects to trim. I want to get rid of this object and that object. Okay. Press Enter when done. Enter. Now I'm done. So I got rid of those lines that go through right, these two openings. Okay. This object in the middle can't be trimmed because it wasn't being clipped by either of the two cutting objects. So instead, I'm going to select that object and press the delete key to make it go away. OK, so now I have the opening for the door. So let's say I want to draw the window, which is right here next to the door. OK, I can again go back to my polyline. Right? And now in this context, it says that from this edge over, I have one foot six. And from this edge over, I have one foot. Okay. So if I were to pick the middle of this wall, it wouldn't be in the right place for the center of the window. Okay? On the bottom here, right, I have one foot and I have one foot, plus my window is in the center, so picking the middle of this window would actually be the right position. Okay? But that's a little bit too much math for me. So instead, I'm going to use I'm going to show you something that's called smart tracking. And that's the this is one thing that's very very important for you to learn today and get comfortable with. And some of you will struggle with this at first at getting it to work correctly and when do you click and whatever. And I'll sit with each one of you and make sure that you understand this if you're struggling with this as a concept. So what smart tracking does is if I pick the polyline tool, I can set a point to reference. And when I do that, I move the mouse over a particular point. So in that case, it's the end point. You can see how that end point turns white. Then, without clicking, I'll drag the mouse in a direction. And when I drag the mouse in a direction, do you see how I get that white guideline that shows up? When I have that white guideline showing up, I can then type a distance. So in this case, it would be one foot relative to the point that I set in the beginning. And it will then start my line one foot away from that point that I first set. Okay? So I can repeat this process. I could set a point here. 
I drag without clicking, and I get that white line. And this time it would be one foot six. And I get to start a line that's one foot six away from this point. So it takes a little practice to get used to that. But once you get the motion down and you understand how the smart tracking works, it's a really quick way of setting up measurements so that you don't actually have to draw lines. The old way of doing this would be to say, oh, let me, uh, let me start here and I'll draw a line that's one foot six there. And then I'll draw a line that goes down like that. Well, when I do that, I end up with a line that's an L. So I have a duplicate line that's over the top of a line that already exists. I don't want that piece of line. So by doing smart tracking, I end up with only the little bit of line. Okay. So I'll do the same thing on the other side, though it's not the most efficient way of drawing the window on the other side. Uh, but just for practice, I set the point. It turns white. I drag the mouse, and I say 1 foot 6. And that's where the line starts. Oops. And obviously, I went over. Let's get rid of that. Let's try it one more time. 1 foot 6 inches. There. Uh, by the way, I, I, I have a habit of doing this. If you right click after a command's done, you can repeat the last command. So if I instead of going back to pick the polyline tool, I just right click. It's such an ingrained habit that it's hard for me to not do that. So we'll come this time over one foot, snap to perpendicular, enter to be done, and I've now drawn those two openings for where the windows would be. Okay? The truth is that that's not the most efficient way of doing it. We're going to mirror this, this window over to that window in just a second. So let's say that I wanted to draw in where the glass would be on this window. Right? I'll zoom in a little bit. I'll go from this midpoint to that midpoint. Enter. So there's the glass. Maybe I want to offset this glass so it has some thickness. Let's offset. And again, I could go up to curve and then offset. And I'm going to type in a distance. This time the distance might be only maybe a quarter of an inch. I do want it both sides. And there I can delete the original image and now, or the original line. And now I have a double line representing that particular window. Okay? So like I said, over here I could draw the same window again. But in reality, it's a lot faster to select. Notice this time I'm selecting from left to right. Everything contained within my box is selected. Right? If I selected the opposite way, it would select the walls, which I don't want. So left to right, I've got that selected. Now I'm going to use the mirror command, which is under transform mirror. Or again, you could type mirror. And I'd like to mirror it across this door, but I don't have anything to snap to anymore. Okay, but at the bottom, I do. So I zoom out a little bit. I'll draw a mirror line right there. And now I'll have this window and that window. Right, so it's more efficient to draw the window once and then mirror it again. Okay? Did you pull the center line on the bottom? I pulled the center line from down here. Right, right. So when, you're, when you do the mirror, yeah. you just pick. It's asking for the start of the mirror plane, which right. is the mirror line. And I pick down here using my midpoint snap to pick the center of that line. Then and then you draw the line here, and then you press Enter. Okay, So let's say I wanted a window at the opposite end. You see how there's a window at the top, and there's a window at the bottom? Right? I can do the exact same thing with this window. I can mirror this window down to the bottom by, again, using the transform mirror command. And I'll pick the midpoint right here in the center. From there, see how I'm, this is the mirror plane. In 2D, it's a mirror line, obviously. In 3D, it's a plane, right? But we're not working in 3D yet. But that's why it calls it a plane, because it would be assuming 3D. Okay, so when I click here to finish, you see that I now have a copy of that window down here. Okay? Well, let's take this a step further, right? You see that I have a window that's, that's oriented on this wall, but then there's also a window that's oriented over here. I'm not limited in my mirrors to mirroring you know, from the center of an object right? just in a traditional sense. I can select this, again go to Transform, Mirror. And instead of picking, right, say if I picked here, it would mirror out over to here. I'm going to mirror across a 45 degree. So I'm going to mirror from here to there. 
and lo and behold, it'll mirror on a 45 degree and give me that window. So I've only drawn the window once, and thus far I've been able to copy it and use it that many times. Okay? So it's, it's all about efficiency. And so the faster you work, the more of those kinds of things you use. If you forget about it or you redraw it, at this stage of the game, drawing's key to practicing anyway. So in reality, I should make you draw these windows for all of them. But I at least want to show you the mirror command too. So let's say I come back down here and I have a, another window that's right next to this window. And I don't actually have dimensions on them, but let's say they're six inches apart. Okay? So I want to copy this window over. And so one of the things that's important to recognize, and this is the same for AutoCAD and for Rhino, is that there are two copies. There's a copy that's available from the Edit menu, and there's a copy that's available from the Transform menu. Okay? The copy that's available from the Transform menu is going to give you a base point to copy from, right? which is the traditional copy. If I were to type copy into the command line, this is the copy it would give me. The copy that's available under the Edit is I want to copy this and move it to another drawing. Right? So it's a different kind of a copy. It's the traditional like copy and paste of like an operating system. So the primary copy that we're going to be using in Rhino is the one that's available under the transform menu. And actually, if we go to transform copy, you'll see that the command is copy. If we go to edit and copy, you'll see that it's actually copy to clipboard is the whole command. So they're actually different commands. Okay. So let's go back, and we're going to go to transform and then copy. Select objects to copy. It's going to be this window. Okay? And I'll go ahead and press Enter to select the objects. Now it's asking me for a point to copy from. So this is where do I want to copy from. Now, I could pick like right on the corner of this window. And if I did, it would be, OK, well, how do I know where to put it? Right? So when I'm doing the copy instead, I'm going to pick using my smart tracking a point that's not right there, but that is the distance away that I'm going to use to snap. So I'll say 6 inches. And so now I'm copying from 6 inches away from that point, and I can snap to right there to give me my two windows that are 6 inches apart. Okay? So it's a little bit easier using that smart tracking, which is why I want to show you the smart tracking, because it makes your life a lot better the more familiar and the more comfortable you are uh, with it. Okay. So I've gone ahead and I've drawn that. Let me see what else we need to do. We've done offset. We've snapped to midpoint. We've done trim. Oh, I didn't talk about join. So right now, I cut a hole through this wall. And I have an object that goes around the outside. And I have a curve that goes around the inside. But it's not connected. It's not one solid line. Because this is a separate line. If I were to select these. And then go to, uh, I think it's under transform join. Might be under edit join. Sorry, I always type join. Yeah, it's under edit join. This will then become one line instead of separate lines, which is useful once we do the extrude in 3D. So I'm going to select those little stub lines like that, and I'll go up to edit and join. And they'll, they will now become one continuous line. Okay? If you don't do that today, it's not the end of the world. I'll repeat that um, when we go to make this a three dimensional object. Uh, down the road. So I'm going to continue on um, using a variety of other commands that are out there. Uh, let's see here. I just want to make sure I got everything else. Okay. So there were a few other things that I wanted to, to talk through. Um, one is if I have a line that didn't quite make it long enough, so let's say I drew a line that was like that, but I really wanted this line to go all the way to there, I can use a command called extend which is a lot like trim. Right? I actually think it's available. Now that's split. Uh, transform. Sorry, I always type extend. Center what? Curve? Extend curve. Thank you. Extend curve. If you type extend, it will do the same thing. Right? Select boundary objects. So this is the object that you want it to extend to. It would be this. I'll press Enter. Select curve to extend. It would be that curve. And it will then extend that curve out until it meets up. Okay. If I wanted to draw six inches away from here, I have a couple options. I could offset that. I could use that as a point 
and create an intersection which I can then draw perpendicular to. Right? So there's a lot of ways of kind of drawing that and finishing that off. Okay? A couple other things that I think are relevant, probably not for right now, but I want to point out. Uh, one is called a fillet. So if I have a line in space here and I have a line in space here, and I want these two to come together with a rounded corner, I can use something called a fillet. So I'll type F-I-L-L-E-T. Or I can go up to, it's probably under curve, fillet curves. Okay. Here I can specify a radius. So let's say I wanted it to be 12 inches, just so you can see it. Select first curve to fill it. It would be this one. Select second curve. It would be that one. And I get a nice arc that connects those two curves. Okay. Something that's available for you. If I didn't want to do a fillet and I wanted it to be angled across, I could use something called a chamfer. So again, it's under curve, chamfer curves. This I'm going to, instead of inputting a radius, I would be inputting distances. So it would be, uh, let's say, 18 inches, second distance, 18 inches. First curve would be here, second curve would be here, and it clips the corner with a straight line. Okay? Another option that's available for you should you want it to be. Now, I like to show you tricks along the way because sometimes they make your life easier. So we did a fillet with a radius. If I have two lines in space that, let me turn off ortho for just a second, that are coming out like this, and I really want these two lines to come together at a nice point, right? I can use that fillet command that I did before. So I can go to surface, or excuse me, curve, fillet curves. And instead of having a radius of 12, I can set the radius to be 0. And this will then cause this line and this line to come together as a point, right? which is a really tricky way of being able to combine lines together. Uh, it's something that I use very, very frequently when I do drawing. Um, so most of the time, my fillet is actually set to 0, so I can do it to connect lines together. So it's just something that's out there, food for thought. Um, we already did mirror. We did chamfer. Uh, let me go ahead and draw the door in place here. And then I'll, I'll show you the door and I'll rotate the door. Uh, so let me go ahead and use the polyline and I'm going to draw the door first. And so this door was three feet long, so I'll type three feet. Um, let me turn back on ortho. It's an exterior door, so it'll be 1.75 inches thick in that direction. I'll use smart tracking to find the end of that. And then I end up with my door. Okay. Next, I want to curve. So I'll come over here to an arc. So draw the arc of the door. Now, this arc is a little bit hard to use. But notice we have several options of arcs. The easiest one for doors is the start, the end, and the direction, which is the third little option over. And so I'll go from the start to the end, and then the direction, and I get a nice arc. Okay. So I have one door drawn. I'd like to draw an another door and put it over here to get out. So let me go ahead and draw a line. I don't know. Let's see here. Let's go from there. We'll go over a foot. It doesn't have any dimensions on it. Let me go ahead and offset. Oops. Offset my distance. I'll do three feet again. And I'll go from here to there. Now I need to do the trim. So again, this is all review. I'll go up to Edit Trim. It's going to ask me for my cutting objects, which would be right here and right here. I'll press Enter. And then I'll select those two. Now, I cheated. I selected them both at once. Right? Remember, from the right to the left, anything it touches will be selected. So instead of picking these like that, I said, draw a box. This way, anything it touches, it'll select and get rid of. So it's just a little bit faster to, to get rid of all of them. So I'll go ahead and hit Enter. I'm done. Let's join those together. Join. And now I have this object here. I'd like to move that down. So let's go ahead and copy it. So I'll take these. Again, selection from right to left to select everything I touch. And then we'll go up to Transform, Copy. And I'm going to copy right from that point. And I'm going to move it right down to there. Now, obviously, we have a problem because this object here is in the wrong, and I need to rotate it so that it goes out. So let me take this and this. Oh, let me hold down Shift so I can select them both. 
and I'm going to use the rotate command. It's under transform, rotate. We're going to talk about what rotate 3D is next class. But for right now, we're just going to do regular rotate. It's going to say center of rotation. Center of rotation would obviously be right there. Okay. Angle or first reference point. Right. I'm just going to do a reference point that goes right along the side here. And then I'll be able to rotate. And again, if I didn't have object snap, or excuse me, if I didn't have ortho on, I could choose to rotate it at any angle. But since I have ortho on, it's going to jump to the 90 degree interval. So I want it to be right there. And now I have the door facing out. So I copied and then rotated. Okay? Just another way of, of doing it. Okay? So I'm going to turn you loose to, to kind of get used to this and start drawing. Remember, if you feel comfortable, embellish it, change it, do whatever you want to it. It's a very, very basic plan. We will take this plan and make a 3D object out of it next class. So when you're done today, you're going to do a couple things. One, you're going to save your work. So I'm going to go to File, Save. And this is going to be a Rhino 5 3D model file, which is a .3DM. So you're used to like InDesign or Photoshop .psd .indd. In this class, you're going to primarily be creating .3DM files. Okay? So let me go ahead and put that on my flash drive. Um, here we go. Let me make a folder for 136. Apparently I can't spell. There we go. And this is exercise 202. And I'm going to save it as exercise 202. And so I'll go ahead and click Save. So that saves the 3D model file. Okay? I also want to be able to show what this looks like on the website when I make my post later today. So I'm going to zoom in so that I, I kind of have a, a nice looking view of my plan. And I'm going to go to this little triangle next to my view. It's right next to where it says top. There's a little tiny triangle. And I'm going to go to Capture to File. And that's just going to create a JPEG of what I see on my screen. So I'll capture to file, and let me go to my flash drive. And today, we'll call this, again, exercise 202. And I'll go ahead and click Save. And if we go look at that file, if I were to open it, see how it's a, a basically a view of what I saw. Okay. It's very rare that you're actually going to print a drawing from Rhino. Um, it's kind of a whole other subject matter. Chances are you're going to do it from AutoCAD or something else. Um, most of what we're going to have out of this class are renderings, which we'll save after we render. R lines don't render, so it doesn't really give us anything. So today we're just going to capture the screen so we have a view so that you have proof that, yes, you did in fact draw something today. Okay. So I will post this to the website the same as I've done before. So just as review, for those of you that have never posted anything or have just done one, I'll go to the website. I'll go to New Post. And we'll say this is Exercise 202. I'm going to scroll all the way down on the right here. Go to Set Featured Image. And I will upload that plan. And then I'll go to Set Featured Image. And it will show up. Perfect. And then I also want to make sure that I categorize this correctly as Digital Tools 136. And this is Exercise 202. So once I have those done and I publish, I'm done and I can turn it in. Okay. So today is very much about learning basic drawing in Rhino. Um, I recognize that for some of you, this will be a complete breeze, and you'll be done with it in about 10 minutes. Right? If I were drawing this, I would be done with it in probably less than five, maybe even less than that. Um, but that's the nature of speed and practice. So if you breeze through it, great. Uh, things will get harder from here on out. Those of you that are struggling with it, that's perfectly OK. That's why we have the whole day to really grasp this and understand what's happening. Okay. Are there any questions before I finish? No? Oh, cool. 
I will uh, float around and help all of you individually.